Check, check, check. Check, check. Check one, two, one, two. Test one, two. If I'd known it was a test, I would have studied. One, three, four, okay. Jazz Morris is in the house. Sue's in the house. Carol Hannon's in the house. Gary and Linda in the house. Carolyn's in the house. Patrick and Deb's in the house. Marsh is in the house. Steve's in the house. in the house. So glad to see you all here this morning. We've got two or three hundred people still in the parking lot, it looks like, coming in. So we'll, we'll just be gracious as they come in. But uh, let's go ahead and start, shall we? So glad to see you all here. What a blessing. What a blessing to see you come in the door. I, I hope you, you have a sense as much from the Holy Spirit as you do from us and others when you walk in. That you're a blessing just by showing up. You know that? Understand how God uses you just when you're obedient in the area of worship? Just come into his house and he points you out. Sue's in the house. Matt's in the house. Carolyn's in the house. And he'll direct your attention to somebody and say, hey, have you prayed for that person this week? Wow. Lots of cool things happen just because you show up. It's a blessing and you're a blessing for being here. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Father, we just do depend on you for everything. Even our attempts, Lord God, to worship you depend on your presence because we just make noise and say words if you're not here. 
You're not adding yourself to what we're doing, Lord. We're just doing nothing. Father, apart from you, we can't do anything. We acknowledge that, Lord, as we worship. We acknowledge you in all our ways, that you would make our paths straight. We thank you so much, Lord God, for the special nature of what's happening today, how our elders have been working so hard to prepare the way for the Lord in, in, in special ways. Thank you so much, Holy Spirit, for the wonderful experience that you have for each of us this morning, just because we've said yes to you, just because we have made this time in this place a priority. Thank you very much, Lord, for loving us. We really do stand in wonder of your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Say thank you, Lord. But now I see, yeah, look around and see, was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. I pray. Just did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers, toils, and snares. I had. heaven when we've been there ten thousand years right shining as the sun we've no less days to say Isn't it true? Amazing grace. We're just barely scratching the surface. Put yourself in eternity now as we worship, okay? Put yourself in a kingdom right now, okay? Sing like you're in heaven now, right? Cool. So in the process that leads up to that, there's this glorious experience of coming to know God. You get introduced to him by various means and ways, and, and you're going to hear some cool things from the elders today. Uh, I'm trying to speed us through this a little bit, and and because uh, we know that whoever the, the, the guy that they have preaching this morning is just so long-winded. They're trying to, oh, it could be, it could be. I wouldn't talk about that, talk about anybody else that way. <laughs> All right, so here's a new song that we're introducing called I'm at Your Command, okay? And this is a song sung to him. 
But is it, it is a perfect follow-up to the whole idea of his amazing grace, okay? So when you experience his amazing grace, it, everything turns from a have to to a want to, okay? I want to know you, Lord. I want to make you known. I bow before your throne, Lord Jesus. I'm at your command. I'm at your command. I'm listening for your voice. I'm trying to obey. I'm calling out your name. Lord Jesus, I'm at your command. I'm at your command. I want to know you, Lord. You're all there is to know. I want to make you known and how you blessed me so. I want to know you, Lord. I'm reaching for your hand. I put my faith in you, oh Lord, I'm at your command. When I stumble and I fall, it's your name, Lord, I call. I love you most of all, Lord Jesus, I'm at your command. I'm at your command I want to know you, Lord I want to know you, Lord You're all there is to know I want to make you known And how you bless me so I want to know you, Lord. I'm reaching for your hand. I put my faith in you, oh Lord. I'm at your command. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord. You're all there is. make you known and how you bless me so I want to know you Lord I'm reaching for your hand I put my faith in you oh Lord I'm at your command I'm at your command. So, as we're discovering, as the Holy Spirit's moving at First Christian, he's talking to a lot of people, including our leadership, about the way, the path, so, there's only one. Isn't that amazing? 
Isn't that cool that he simplified it and broke it down? Only one way, right? Let's celebrate that. I lay my life down at your feet. You're the only one I need. I turn to you and you were always there. Thank you, Lord. Troubled times, it's you I see. Put you first, that's all I need. I humble all and all to you. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. You were always, always there, every how and everywhere. Your grace abounds so deeply within me. You will never, ever change yesterday to One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living all for you. You are the way. You are the way, the truth. The life we live by faith and not by sight for you living all for you one way one way Jesus you're the only one that I could live for one way Jesus you're the only one that I one way one way Jesus you're the only one that I could one way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. Amen. Amen. Isn't it great to have Matt and Linda up here? Aren't they great? So good. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to bring joy to your heart. We just thank you, Lord, that just like parents do with little kids, not so much worried about the performance. They're just so glad to see the pleasure. Thank you, Lord God, that you don't look on our performance. You don't look on external appearance. You look at the real us, who we truly are. You look at our souls. And Lord God, we just know, as you put in your word, that you love it when you look at us and see our souls worshiping, expressing our love to you. That is why we're here today, Father God. And we just want to do that better and better and better and better because it reflects you. But we're so thankful, Lord, that you're not judging us on that. You're looking at our spirits looking at our hearts. We would just like to take this second here, Lord God, and ask that you would forgive us for all of our sins, the things that the enemy so wants to occupy our minds with, the things that would get between us and being here for worship, whether it's fear or lack of faith or whatever. Father, thank you for your grace, your amazing grace that speaks to our hearts directly and says, child, I love you. Just keep trying. Try hard. Thank you, Lord God, for being such an amazing father to us, your children. In Jesus' name, amen. I think children are released to... Children's Church got an amen out of Violet back there. That's always cool.
Uh, some of you may not have known that I would be preaching this morning. Uh, if you'd like to leave, I don't blame you. Go. It will take a minute. You can just... <laughs> that was Linda's idea. <laughs> so we're in this process, brothers and sisters, and for, for those of you who are online with us, we so want you to be here. We miss you. You are needed. There's a special dynamic that expands and increases every time a new person comes into the house of God because God will use you just by being here. We wish we could see all the faces of those who are online. We wish because it, it would add to that. We would have this sense of, oh, there's somebody that I need to pray for, or whatever. So when we're out of touch and we're not visual with each other, it's really harder for us to remember to pray to present one another to Christ. So I just trust that if you're online and watching on Zoom, that you'll just sense that desire and that eagerness that we have here to see God's house full, to see his people standing out in faith. And as part of the spiritual pathway development that the leadership at First Christian Church is developing, um, I've been invited and I'm totally honored to bring the message this morning. And it's a continuation of what we did the last time I preached. We're talking about the four keys to a wonderful life with God. You may notice that there's a folding table <coughs> excuse me, on the platform. We'll be making use of that as in a visual uh, toward the end of the message. And uh, Elder Barry and Elder John are going to come up uh, at the conclusion of the message uh, to speak some very important things to all of us. So this whole idea of uh, four keys to a wonderful life with God is directly connected to the purpose of the church survey uh, that the leadership has developed and put out. I think everybody's uh, filled one out, perhaps. Uh, if you haven't, you still can. We totally invite that. Uh, these surveys have been filled out by people more than once, and that's right and good. Uh, and the way that the Lord is speaking and leading our leadership with regard to what you are com communicating and conveying on the survey is really awesome. I met with uh, Barry and John uh, Friday night uh, before the movie and the meal, which was terrific. Um, and I got to tell you, I'm excited. I'm excited at what's going on in the two of them. And, not, and Robert. Robert Davis and, and Wendy and others who are helping, Jamie and others who are involved at, at that level, uh, very excited at what's going on with John and Barry as well, and, I, and I'm sure they'll share some of that. So look, this whole idea of the church survey is pointed at one of the real issues in terms of ourselves and others. We look at this particular church survey in the light of 2 Corinthians 13.5, where it calls us, as Christians, to examine ourselves. Examine ourselves. Don't know if you know how to do that biblically. It's very important that you do. 2 Corinthians 13.5, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Whoa. That's a pretty important diagnostic to do. He's saying, hey, hey, look, you can tell yourself, you can tell whether you are in the faith or not. And so test yourselves. This is a really, really important concept for us as Christians, and especially for a church. We have to understand why he has said, test yourselves. Test yourself. You've heard this, the term practice makes perfect. Heard that before? I've been teaching sports and other things since I was 18 years old. And one of the most misleading things that you can teach in sports is that practice makes perfect. Okay, because there's a real problem with that concept. If you're practicing wrong, 
See? Practice doesn't make perfect unless you're practicing perfect. If you continue to do something wrong over and over and over and over, no matter how long you practice it, you're just going to get better at being worse. <laughs> that makes sense. That's good. Okay? So practice, what, what, what does in perfect practice makes perfect? Okay? Perfect practice makes perfect. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27. Listen with the ears of your spirit now. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Because it has its foundation on the rock. That's really important keys here, right? Starting to get an idea of how you can self-assess. Is your foundation on the rock? Do you even have a foundation? What condition is it in? He says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice or practices them wrong is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down. The streams rose. The winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. Brothers and sisters, that's, those are tough circumstances being described there. That's storm and damage and death. And terrible destruction he's talking about. And we're not talking about physicality here, your actual house or apartment. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the spiritual now. The rain and the streams and the winds, all those things are things that are coming against you. This church and every church since COVID is in recovery from having their house beat on and the storm hit and damage done. People are living in fear now. Know why? They do not know how to self-assess and examine themselves. So putting Jesus' words into practice looks like wa-wupafa. Okay? Just get, I know, I know it's, it's bad. Wa-wupafa. I, my brain has limits. I couldn't go any place but just whoop, 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 whatever. But it's worship, the word, prayer, and fellowship. These four keys are the foundation that Christ speaks of when he says his foundation was on the rock. See, we're not talking about worship, the word, prayer, and fellowship being the rock. This is what you build on the rock. This is how you self-assess. And so we understand then that Wawupafa will do you no spiritual good if you're not practicing Wawupafa as God defines them. As God defines them. So let me go through these four again. We're reviewing just a little bit. Worship. Worship then, biblically is the soul expressing love to God, okay? Now, we've added a layer here. We're not just saying the definition. We're, we're, we're saying the identity word here. It's not just the mission of expressing love to God. It's the identity of who you are. You have to get there first before you can do worship right and practice it right. This is the soul expressing love. That's who we are. We are spirit beings in a flesh body. We are souls. And it is when the soul worships that we are in rightness with regard to practice. Jesus said, the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
with all your mind. Whew. Is that all? <laughs> right? Anybody that has a sense of spiritual reality looks at that and says, oh man, I, uh, oh, I'm in trouble. The greatest commandment, I, I'm not doing it. Take it easy now. The Word does a lot to help us with that, right? You see, uh-oh, I'm not doing, I don't think I'm, what do I do now? Okay, read your Bible. Go to the Word. And we understand now that the Word is the written voice of God on which the soul feeds. Okay, so we got the soul word in there again. Okay, The word is the written voice of God. Now, it's more than that, of course. It's alive. We talk about that a lot more. It's alive and it feeds our spirits. It feeds our very souls. And on what do we feed? Words on a page? Philosophy of life? No. Fall way short if you go there. We're talking about feeding on God Himself. The Word is not something. The Word is someone. Isn't that cool? The Word is Him. And we're feeding our very souls on God Himself. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Spiritually hungry. Spiritually thirsty. Not talking about a loaf of bread from Safeway. Talking about soul and food for the spirit. We move on to prayer. We're, we're, we're moving through this and the elders will have more to say and we'll have more to say as we go through this process. But we are adding layers now for every person in this church to embrace and understand. So let's move to prayer. One of the most misunderstood Christ concepts in Scripture. You can do this. You can go out and ask some people, hey, what's prayer? Well, how do you define prayer? Nine out of ten of them. You know what they're going to say? Oh, it's talking to God. I have trouble with patience at this point. Because he has said so many times in so many ways, I already know what you have to say. There's nothing you can inform me about. Your prayer life should not be defined as talking to God, transmitting to God, informing God, telling Him what's going on with you. He knows you're wasting His time. And you're missing the whole point of prayer from the heart of God. See, prayer is the soul listening to God. And this does include inquiring. Okay? Did I miss one? Oh, good. You know, listening, I just want to tell you, it's okay to inquire. It include, the, the listening, it can include the asking. I, you know, I've seen so many cool examples of this with parents and kids. The parent already knows the condition of Robbie's tennis shoes. They already know. They came in while Robbie was sleeping at night and looked at the tennis shoes and said, well, wife, we need to get this boy some shoes. He's worn them out again. Man, boy, right? And then Rob gets up in the morning. He goes to dad. Dad, I need to let you know something. Uh, my shoes are getting really worn out. Okay, that's cool. If you don't think dad knows, all right, you can go. Could I have some more? Could I have, but understand, as you develop your spiritual soul strength, that this is going to happen less and less because you're going to come up and go, I wonder what dad's got for me today. Could I have some new tennis shoes? Perfectly fine to inquire of the Father. Perfectly fine to go and ask, what would you have me do? What, what's, what do you think? 
What do you have to say to me about this? Perfectly fine. But then you have to, you can't just say amen and stop listening. Prayer is 24-7. It's always listening. It's always keeping your spiritual ears, the ears of your soul, perked and listening. I've seen this with parents and little kids. We talked about this before, very briefly. They're both asleep. The child's in the other room in the crib. The plane goes over. They don't wake up. The dog barks. They don't wake up. The car goes by. They don't wake up. And the little child goes, bang, and they're both instantly awake. And they're in there. It's okay. Is it okay? Is she okay? How does that happen? Because even in the unconscious state of sleep, those parents had their ears perked for any sound that that child might make. Still listening. Not listening for the plane, not listening for the dog. No, 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 no. Listening for the child's voice. This is a spiritual concept for us that we as children have to always be listening for the father's voice. Haven't you seen that? Saw one of the funniest things on America's Funniest Video. Little kids like this showing off and just about ready to step off the edge of a really bad place. Just showing off, right? Just about ready to step off. And this happens. Hey! All it took was one word from the dad. (laughs) Here's the kid. And the dad goes, hey! Now, if that child's not listening, ow. I've seen it so many times. Children that listen do way better than children that don't. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. We move to fellowship. Fellowship is souls united in Christ. This is a huge word for any church. United. These truths that God has put in His Word, that He speaks to us in prayer, and that we express back to Him in worship, they unite us. We are in agreement upon these essentials for life in Christ. God's word says in 1 John 1.3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. Now, now look, they've seen and heard, okay? Eyes open, ears perked, 24-7. God is always speaking, always showing. Are you always listening? Always looking. Proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. Fellowship. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Woo! So we're not talking about fellowship being something that happens between brothers and sisters. Oh, that happens. But that can only happen if you're in fellowship with the Father. The invitation is to come and be in fellowship with the Father with us, not to be in fellowship with us. Fellowship can't happen correctly. You're practicing it wrong. If you don't fellowship as a result of your fellowship with the Father, these are the truths that unite us, upon which we can all agree and stand together. Fellowship is mindful of the meaning of the word and it's not about fellows when they say fellows on the same ship it's about being fellow workers you know and that's not a gender thing that's just an all inclusive we're all in this together we are all on the same spiritual ship brothers and sisters and guess what we're all going to the same destination we're not going to say well I'm going to heaven man kingdom of God where are you going oh I'm doing the karma thing 
What are you doing on this ship? This ship doesn't go to karma. This is not the karma cruise line. <laughs> karma cruise line. That's, that's not my notes. Anyway. <clears throat> It's amazing how many people do not understand how God defines his own terms in his own book. We want to rewrite it and put what we think it should be, what works for us. This spiritual pathway that the elders and staff are working on for this church is completely against that. Hallelujah. This is about walking a path with God that results in all these wonderful things. And so practice then, this whole idea of practicing Jesus' words clearly implies the need for improvement. If you've got it all going on, what do you need to practice for? How do you ask that of our drummer on the worship team? Matthew Watson. You say, dude, you're already good. Why? He's over practicing and he's teaching lessons and he's playing for the uh, Academy of Music. What's the name again? Brent. Say it again. Brent. Brent. Brent? Academy of Music. And it's in Concord? It's in Lafayette. It's doing all this stuff. Just don't need to practice anymore. Don't need to practice anymore. Why are you practicing? Oh, I'm over the practicing. Practicing. Why? You're already good. A, to stay good. B, get better. To get better. Anybody here by a show of hands, don't any of you raise your hands. Anybody here cannot get any better spiritually? <laughs> Notice I said don't raise your hand. <laughs> don't want to trick you. In it. There's nobody in the world that cannot get any better spiritually, that cannot improve their relationship with Christ. There's nobody. How you go about that and what those areas are is what examining yourself is all about. See, we're not interested in this. God's word does not put this out for us. Yeah, we'll be judged. Go judge each other. Nah. See, this spiritual improvement, this form of spiritual improvement is entirely possible, and it's absolutely biblical. Now, you don't want to be measured, as you're, as you're self-assessing, you don't want to be measured by your spiritual performance with regard to salvation, right? Spiritually wise Christians don't want anything to do with God's justice from a salvation standpoint, right? Because why? <laughs> we know we're guilty. <sighs> Yike. What would my grade be? Flunk. Total fail. My righteous deeds are as filthy rags. There's nothing passable about them. Spiritual, spiritually wise Christians understand that and say, oh man, justice just condemns and convicts me. I'm guilty. No, no argument. I got no defense. So I don't want that. What I want and need is where I go from understanding that I'm guilty. See, justice is getting what you deserve. See, and you think about what you really deserve with regard to God. I ye, don't even want to think about it. Yike. But, but, but then there's mercy. Now you're talking my language. Now, now you know what I need and what I desire. Mercy, please, because I already know I'm guilty. Mercy, then, as far as God is concerned, is not getting what you deserve. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that he does not treat me as my sins deserve. And grace then, that amazing grace we sung about this morning, grace is getting what you do not deserve. Great analogy of this. Uh, you're speeding down the road and a little too fast, get pulled over by a police officer. He pulls up the car, can I see your stuff? Give me your ID. Yeah, yeah, here, whatever. He goes, you know, Rob, you were doing 210. <laughs> oh, I thought it was the freeway sign. <laughs> I'm not buying it. 
Uh, but I've done a little background check on you while I was writing up the ticket, and I understand some things about you. And you're like, you do? You did? Really? Yeah, I'm not going to write you up. Really? Wow, thank you, because you know you deserve to be. And he says, and look, my, my research tells me that, you know, you, you're in some hard times. So I just felt like the Lord prompted me as a police officer, here's $20. What? <laughs> yeah. Now you're getting what you don't deserve. You didn't get what you did deserve. And that was mercy. Now, in addition to the mercy, because God doesn't just stop at mercy. Well, you deserve to be punished, and disciplined, but I'm going to let you off the hook. Okay, forgiveness. But you're not in heaven at that point. You're just at zero. You're just back to zero now. You have gained nothing until he pours his grace in. You know, I'm richer. I'm richer than I was as a result of an encounter with him and an experience with him. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Amazing grace. See, once saved, the issue of spiritual growth and being a strong soul becomes central to our relationship with God. Central. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Oh, Okay, uh, and now it, you think that the mission is for you to do that. No, you can't. You can't. So how then? How, how, how do I get strong? How do I know if I'm strong in the Lord? How, how do you know? One of the biggest problems that people we, that, that we have with regard to people rejecting Christianity and, and religion in general, for that matter, is the perception that it's going to be other people judging you. It, it's going to be some other person telling you whether you are strong in the Lord or not and how and what you need to do. That is instant put off. Instant defense mechanism. Instant rejection. Because correctly, they instinctively sense that we're not qualified to judge them. We're not. We're barely able to judge ourselves. We can only do that according to God's word. Again, it says, examine yourself. See, people are afraid and, and reject the idea that they're going to be judged by other people. Heard this before? Don't judge me. Don't judge me. See, it's so right away you got to understand, oh, no, 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 no. Our church is not about that. The scriptures are not about that, me judging you and you judging me. You, you can judge yourself. But you got to understand that that's God's test by God's word. And it's pressure and it's fear and it's all kinds of weirdness in the child's heart and mind that resists this relational reality with God. It's his test. It's his, we're, we're his creation. Everything is his. He's in charge. It's his test. It's his criteria. It's his judgment that matters. And so right away you're like, oh man, oh man. God's going to judge me. Oh, my goodness. It says to examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. To see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you know how to do this? Do you know how to test yourself? According to God's word? This is the key component for the spiritual pathway that the leadership at First Christian Church is developing. It's exciting. It completely addresses one of the biggest reasons for why people do not want to have anything to do with the church. Because they think it's just a place where you come in and get judged. 
by other people who aren't qualified to judge you. It's like, wow, okay. And when it comes down to that, then you ask, oh, so, well, oh boy, the test. Here's the test. Oh boy. If you give yourself the kind of score that I tend to give myself, it's not pretty picture. It's scary. It's humbling. And it begs this kind of response. Okay, what's going to happen if I don't pass the test? What happens if I'm like, is God still going to love me? What's at stake here? So be real careful now. Be real careful to stay in that place where we know we have to be in order for these things to work correctly, for practice to be perfect. We have to stay in that place of grace. It is by grace you have been saved. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Thanks. Sorry I had to drag that out. It is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this, not even your faith is from yourself. It's the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Will God still love you if you flunk? Yeah. How do we know? Because he's forgiven Rob. I mean, he's forgiven King David. He's forgiven Moses. These guys messed up big time. I, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to compare too much, but <clears throat> with regard to David, David's one of my main guys in the Bible. I love him. Dude's a murderer. I haven't ever had anybody killed. Show of hands, anybody had anybody killed? <laughs> right? Oh boy. This grace is extraordinary. This is one of the reasons for why God was so pleased with King David. Because David demonstrated his faith and trust in God by accepting God's discipline. Discipline comes from the word disciple, by the way. He embraced the word of the Holy Spirit. As embarrassing or as challenging as it may have seemed at the time to David. And he said, test me. Test me, O Lord. And try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For your love is ever before me. That gracious, amazing love is ever before me. And I walk continually in your truth. He says further, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, that is not somebody else judging you. That's you listening to God and Him as your loving Father, informing you and explaining to you what's going on here. Worship, the Word, prayer, and fellowship. Those four keys to a wonderful life with God provide a healthy way for each person to spiritually examine themselves, not each other, ourselves. Simply ask yourself if you're strong in each of the four keys to a wonderful life with God, according to God's word. Are you strong in each of these? Further, which one is weakest, even if you're strong in all four? Which of these is weakest in you? Why does God test our hearts? It's not so that he can know what's in them. He doesn't give us this test, you understand? So he goes, well, i got to find out what Rob's situation really is. He already knows. So why then does God test our hearts? Brothers and sisters, God looks at the heart. We look at the outward appearance. That's why we're not qualified to judge one another. We cannot look upon the soul 
as only God can. Further, God does not judge by external appearance. Galatians 2.6. Huge passages of scripture for us to absorb and process. See, so why then? Why does he test us? God tests our hearts so we can know what's in our hearts. You can't even believe yourself. If you try to singularly, without him, judge yourself and assess yourself, <laughs> you're going to be too harsh, like I am with myself mostly, or too generous. Neither is correct. God puts us through these things, and he orchestrates these tests, and he makes this information known to us so that we can understand what he sees and understands in us. This is the beginning of a spiritual revolution in the person's life. One of the first steps to take that leads you to the mountaintop. See, why don't we know what's in our own hearts? In large part we do, but when it comes to even knowing that we're saved, we won't believe what we tell ourselves if there's stuff in our hearts that's spiritually condemning. Isn't the enemy good at this? You're not saved. What makes you think you're saved and going to heaven? I, I, t t just think back all the stuff that ran through your mind in the last 24 hours. Oh, man. Maybe I'm not saved. Well, why are you going there? See, if there's stuff in our own hearts that we know are spiritually condemning, it's going to be really tough for us to get around that. You're going to either have a sense you have no hope or that you'd lie to yourself. Not fun. Not what God intends at all. The enemy, the father of lies, is so good at pointing out our sins and making a case that God not only doesn't love you, but won't allow you into heaven because all the bad stuff you've done and continue to do. And so in denial of all the gunk in our own childish hearts, we'll blame everything and everybody, including God, for our own sins, insisting that we're good enough to get into heaven on our own deeds. We've been through this whole COVID thing. I'm sick to death of it. I hate what happened in response to this disease. I can understand it, quite a bit of it. But the spiritual lesson in it is amazing. How can anybody say they're good enough to get into heaven on their own when they're con contaminated with the virus of sin? Uh, uh, yes, I have spiritual COVID, but I'm still a good person. <laughs> It doesn't matter. You're infected. You're contaminated. And so how then can we come to believe and accept all this that he does love us and, 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 and we are forgiven and we, we, yes, I'm going to heaven and I know it. I don't just cross my fingers and hope it. How do we come in to believe and accept all this, that we are truly God's children. Brothers and sisters, there's only one way you can know, and that's when he tells you. Oh, you can hope all you want, and you can self-talk all you want, but you, deep down, will know that you don't know. It's when God conveys these things to us that we know. The same way we come to believe and accept that God loves us and has forgiven us and has adopted us into his own eternal family, he tells us himself. We have a personal experience with God. Not an intellectual experience with information, not an emotional experience from need. An actual Holy Spirit to human spirit experience orchestrated and empowered by him.
That's why Romans 8.16 is such an amazing teaching verse. This is a great one to memorize. The Spirit Himself testifies to who? Our spirits that we are God's children. Now, if you can't believe somebody else, and you can't believe yourself, you can believe Him. That's His responsibility. To do the speaking. To testify, yes, son, I love you. Yes, daughter. Look in my eyes, daughter. I love you. Do you believe me now? Yes, father. Yes, Lord. It's the only way that it works. It's the only way that practice becomes perfect. This is one of Linda's favorite verses. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. It's like you can, you can see John going, oh, dudes and dudettes. Think about it. God's calling us His children? Us? Wow. That's amazing grace. Getting what we don't deserve. Makes me love him a lot. I don't know about you. Makes me love him a lot. It's an amazing experience with God when we hear these things from him. It's only then that we can believe and accept it. And even then, it's still sometimes a struggle. And so we, we read in the word 1 Thessalonians 2.4, we are not trying to please men in this. We are trying to please God who tests our hearts so that we can know. Well, Wapafa are the four spiritual corners of our lives built on the rock of Christ Jesus, who is the appearance of God on earth as a flesh and blood man, as prophesied. As we move forward on the spiritual path that our church leadership is developing and preparing, each of us should be keeping them before the Lord in our prayers. Okay? Just to help you on that. Like just kind of, just in your own mind, in your own heart, just say, Lord, help me remember to bring Elder Barry and Elder John before you for the next month. Each of us should be listening for what the Holy Spirit is saying to us as individual children of God and as his holy bride and body, the church of God. There is much in our future that God desires to do that will be truly glorious if we commit to his path of Wapafa. Keep in mind that as you get stronger and stronger, you're going to have more and more opportunities to share and you're going to have an opportunity to point this out to people. That to have a saving relationship with God, all you do is receive. You receive his offer of spiritual adoption, his offer to be his child, his offer to trust him in everything. Okay? And so when we talk about these four corners, and the elders are going to come up in just a minute. I had this table up here to just to illustrate, and we're going to do this more. There'll be more illustrations. I want you to think of this table as the as the four wonderful key, the four keys to a wonderful life with God. Okay, you got four legs: worship. Can you everybody see it? Worship, the Word, prayer, and fellowship. Yeah, pretty solid. You can put stuff on it. You know, it's pretty reliable. All kinds of cool stuff. I got a few things up here. That, but yeah, yeah, and this one even has water in it. <clears throat> uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, so. <clears throat> Getting a little nervous? You should be. Oh, man, if I spill this, there are going to be some, right? Huh? And what are you ask, asking God to put on the table of your life? <clears throat> Is it something big? 
asking him to do something big. What you all think is going to happen when I put this up here on the table with three legs? It's not going to be a pretty picture. I don't even going to do it. Okay? Because it's not going to, it's not going to work. All that's about to happen is problems. You're asking God to put stuff on the table of your life and he's saying, you're not prepared. Why are you asking me to put stuff on the table of your life and you got three, maybe only two? Prepared for God means all four legs strong. You got four legs on the chair that you're sitting on. What do you think would be happening to you right now if I went over and took one of those legs away? <laughs> or you could, you could maybe find a way to balance. It's not fun. And you're in danger of falling all the time. You understand, this is not the rock. These are the four corners of the foundation that has to be built on the rock. Okay. If you get all four of these legs on sand, it's still going down. It has to be all four legs, brothers and sisters. Worship, the word, prayer, fellowship. All four have to be strong. Be, dealing with COVID as a Christian and dealing the, with this world today as a Christian requires soul strength. If you want to have incredible experiences with God, if you want people who come into this church to have incredible experiences with God, and you want to be able to say, look, you need to come to my church, man, because you're just going to have a great experience with God, then this has to be happening in the people of this church. And you show him that you're committed to this process. Just wait and see what he puts up on the table. Yeah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the glory of your word, the experience of hearing your voice, the joy of putting joy in your heart, and the encouragement of fellows on the same ship. We love you, Lord God. We thank you for the ways in which you've been sharing with our elders, and as they come to speak now, Father, thank you for keeping hearts open, minds alert. In Jesus' name, amen. Still working on that. Where's your prayer? And I and I love the the demonstration, um, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a little context for our survey that we took. And I said it was like uh, doing uh, when you go to the doctors and you get uh, first thing they check your weight, right? They check your blood pressure, and a couple of things just so they have a record. And that's how we are using that now. And uh, we will do it again and again. And we will see, we'll be able to self-analyze. So recently, about two, three weeks ago now, we were studying in First Peter 3, 8, and 9. Um, Darren brought us that message. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do. And he will grant you his blessings. Uh, now that moved me. And I, I pulled it out and I put a little divider there. And when we had our Sermon 2.0 class, I was really into that 
Um, and then I got this opportunity to come up and speak. And I was thinking about how, how can I give you a context for how I feel about it. And I went back and looked at that same Bible verse. Now, when I read it the first time, I was really happy. I was excited that uh, I, what I got out of it was that I have to be a blessing to receive a blessing. You know, maybe at some point I had a Bible and that was the heading. And I, and I just got that idea. And I, was, I thought, you know, God's really talking to me and I've got it. But then I went back and I used this worship, word, prayer, and fellowship as a model for how can I look at God's word and maybe get a better understanding about it. So in, in the, I'm going to break it down real quickly for you. Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other. Well, that's unity. That's one of the items that we had on our survey. And that worship leg, and then Barry and I went through all of your responses, and we took a little tally, and then we said, okay, now, which word fits in which leg? So we came up with that unity comes under the leg of worship and the word. Going on in First Peter, love each other as brothers and sisters. Well, that's unity. That's the worship leg and the word. It's also outreach. That's a fellowship leg and the prayer leg. We have to pray for those that we want to help. Uh, we have to really reach out and get to them. And encouragement. Uh, that's under the worship leg and the fellowship leg. Back to, the, back to First Peter. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Well, that's leadership. You have to be tenderhearted. You have to learn to keep a stiff upper lip. And if you're not humble, somebody will let you know pretty quick. Don't repay evil for evil, but don't, and don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. Well, that comes under perseverance. Hopefully you remember these words. Uh, that's the word of uh, the word leg and the prayer leg. Outreach, fellowship and prayer leg, encouragement, worship leg and fellowship leg. First Peter, that is what God has called you to do. Well, that's spiritual growth. Remember we asked you how did you feel about your spiritual growth? That comes under worship leg and the word leg. Serving God, another question we had, worship leg and a fellowship leg. And he will grant you this blessing. That's God's gifts. Do you know your God's gifts? That's under the word leg and the prayer leg. And I love Rob's uh, demonstration. I'm going to drag it over. Only so I can shout at the microphone so those online can hear me. Um, our first question in the survey was about faith. And that was our strongest, in, in all of our surveys, that was the strongest. And why is that? Because if this tabletop is faith, it's each of these legs that supports that faith. So while I may be strong in the word, I may be weak in fellowship, okay? But together, collectively, our faith is strong. Now, I like Rob's demo. I'm going to try it too, Rob. <laughs> See if I can get it to stand up. Okay. Thank you. All right, I got the same water. It's getting a little wet up on top here. I got to tell you the <laughs> truth. <laughs> so, I'll be honest, I'm not one of those people that runs out there. Uh, first person to greet you in the line, I'm a little bit more withdrawn. It's a little hard for me sometimes to do the fellowship. You know, once I know you. I can even give you a hug, but, you know, i got to build up to it. What does that look like? And I like Rob's idea. What if I don't do fellowship? And I say, well, i got three legs. Maybe that's good enough. I'll get somebody, Rob, Barry, and I'll let them do fellowship. Hey, that'll work. Look, that's pretty strong. Except, well, it's not quite the same, is it? It's going to tip. That happens to be a pretty good fit, but it's not perfect. We need to look at all of these things. That's how we strengthen our fellowship. Fellowship was in every one of those questions. Excuse me. Faith was in every one of those questions. Okay. There was one, one other item that was in every one of those 
questions, and that's leadership. And I think leadership is like the rubber foot. We're not any better at picking that out, but it's part of our job is to make sure you're on a firm footing. If we see a little slip, if we can help you build up, that's our job. So that's how I see it. Um, I thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Barry. I do want to close my part with one little thing that's important to me personally, and that's about the Restoration Church and how we get here. And I, I really like that Rob pointed out this isn't a gimmick. This isn't a, 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 something added to the word. This is something that we do to better understand the word, that we do to better worship, that we do to have better fellowship, more meaningful fellowship, and uh, that will change our prayer life if we build all of these strength things. So um, I see it as a blessing. I'm excited about going forward. Like any other program, we're going to start picking up speed, but hang on because it's going to be fun. It's going to be, you know, with Rob at behind the wheel, it's going to be a wild ride. Thank you, Rob and John. Wanted to share, I guess, um, a, maybe a bigger picture perspective. One of the things that I've been praying about and asking God for is, you know, God, where is this journey going? You know, you know, and, and you know, He's not going to tell us the whole thing. He's not going to give us everything. But give me a picture of where we're going, and that because I think it's important. I mean, how often do we want to? You kind of want to have a little bit of a picture of where we're going if you're going to start a journey, right? In that, and so I've been praying that, and God, you know, gave me a number of, of insights um, in that. I'm only going to share a couple of them today, and that. But not only did He give me a picture, a little bit of where we're going, but perhaps a bit of a picture of where we've been, because I think it's important to understand, you know, where we're starting in that. And so, again, I, um, I just wanted to share a couple of pictures. Came from unusual spots in the Bible. It wasn't again. This is the kind of things where you kind of pay attention. You know, when God speaks to me um, through verses in Ezekiel, and if you read Ezekiel, you'll realize it's mostly, you know, Ezekiel telling the people, you're doomed, you're going, you know, you're getting judged, you're going into captivity. There's a lot of negative stuff in that. And so when and God gave me a verse there, and another verse out of Hosea. How many read Hosea recently? Not too many. I have a Kathy, I got a faithful reader. So I want to share just a couple of pictures about perhaps where we've been and where we're going. So let me share a little bit in that. So we start in Ezekiel. And right in the middle of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 34, um, Ezekiel has this prophecy really to the leaders of Israel. And, that, and so his, his picture is, all right, leaders of Israel, you have failed as shepherds of the people. But he says, you know, God says, I will be your shepherd now. I'm going to take where I wanted just to read a couple of verses here about God being our shepherd and what that means. And it, and it relates to our picture here of a pathway in that. And so I'll start in, in verse 11 and, and listen to the language about where we've been and where God is taking us in that. So um, Ezekiel 34, 11 and 12, he says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and deliver them from all that they were scattered from on that cloudy and gloomy day. And so it's a picture, a little bit of where we've come from. He's here he's describing a picture of being scattered you ever feel that? A little bit of COVID, a little bit of stuff, all the churches, we've been scattered, we've been isolated, right? And God is saying, I am going to gather you. I'm going to draw you back from that. So a bit of a picture. I've been scattered, I'm going to bring you back together. A couple of verses further down, he says, in verse 15, I will feed my flock and lead them to rest, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, to bind up 
the broken and to strengthen the sick. And so what we see, what God was sharing with me in these verses was a picture of where we've been and where we're going. We've been scattered and isolated. God wants us to bring us together so we can be protected and united again. And that, I mean, he's taking, you know, people from two different churches and, and uniting them together. And that if you think about, you know, you know, sheep, they're not real good at defending themselves, right? That wasn't their thing. God didn't design them that way. They need a shepherd to protect them in that. And so be, when you're scattered, you're vulnerable. And so one of the pictures is God is going to unite and protect us. The second one is many of us feel like we've been broken in some ways or another in that. And God said, I am going to bind you up and heal you and bring you to a place of strength. And lastly, many of you know, he talked about, I am going to to um, strengthen and heal those that are sick, those that are spirit. This is a spiritual picture. Those that perhaps are spiritually sick. God is bringing us to a point of being spiritually healthy. And that. And I don't know if, um, and if you think about this, it not only applies at a church level, you know, as as our church goes, but it also applies at a personal level, right? Each of us has our own things where we're, we feel isolated and. And we feel injured and, and, and we feel sick spiritually. And God wants to bring us to that place of strength and health. So that's one of the pictures that I got um, in that. Now also in that, in that same picture was a message for us as leaders. Because God was warning there the, the leaders of Israel, you have failed to be the shepherd of your sheep. And it wasn't directly that message to us as leaders, but he was, it was an encouragement. You need to be the shepherd in this flock to help lead and, and, and guide and protect. And so it was also an encouragement for us as leaders that we be more active in that because in times we have not done that to the best of our abilities. And that, so it's another opportunity for us as leaders to grow into. So the second passage, um, again, another... Um, odd place. I don't read in Hosea too often. Um, but this one, and, and you know God brings these in different ways. This one I was um, just looking over my Facebook page and actually one of our own um, congregants um, who, who's normally at home because of her health reasons, Irene, had posted this on her Facebook page. Just out of the blue I just noticed it and it just stood out like a, ever have that stuff that just stands out kind of like a bright light? And this was one of those. And this is out of Hosea. Um, and again, it's a picture of God wanting to restore Israel. But, um, and he says in the middle of Hosea 2.15, he said, And out of the valley of Achor, I will bring a door of hope. Okay, what in the heck does that mean? There's something there in that. And so I went to look at, well, what was the valley of Achor? You know, and, and again, I didn't, again, I got to study my Bible a little more. It comes back from the, you know, the history of the people of Israel. You remember when Joshua led the people out of, out of, into the promised land? What was the first place they went to? Jericho, right? Remember, they had, you know, God told them, right, you're going to march around the city. Anyway, ma amazing victory for the people of Israel. They didn't believe they could destroy this you know, fortified city of Jericho. Had an amazing victory. They celebrated that. So the next city they came to was Ai. They figured, Jericho was, you know, we did that, just a piece of cake. What happened in Ai? Utterly creamed. They got beat up and left running. Okay, it was a, it was a, a, a great place of defeat for them. And that so the Valley of Achor came out of that experience for the people of Israel. It was a place of disappointment, a place a low point for the people of Israel as they were entering the Promised Land. And so what is God saying here? I am going to take that very place in your church, that very place in your life that is a low point, that perhaps is a, is a, is a sense of disappointment, discouragement, and I am going to turn it into what? A door of hope. And, that, and so that's the picture 
the second picture that God gave me of, of several, is that God wants to take us from the point we're at, the places we're at, and transform that into a, into a place of strength, a place of being spiritually healthy, a place of being united and protected in that. And so this process becomes a door of hope for us. And, he, and he's going to take those very things that, that we've been through that are hard and turn them into something of hope. And I can guarantee all of us have got those things in our lives. As a church, we have those things. And God is going to use this. Those things aren't wasted. Those difficult times are not wasted. God wants to turn them into hope and in that. So do you believe that? Can God do that? So that's the pathway. I just wanted to give you kind of a high-level high picture um, of what God's been, kind of been given to me in that. And I think it's an exciting journey. It's not going to happen overnight. This is a process and a journey. Um, but God has an amazing place for us to go. And, and he understands where we're coming from. And he wants to make that, turn that into something, something glorious. So, so I'm going to pray for real quick, and then we're going to have Robert come up and share in communion, one of the highlights of our service. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this pathway you have began us on, Father. It's a journey that we begin those steps. We know there's many more steps to come. Guide us. Thank you for drawing all of these people together into one flock, into one place. Lord, help us to become united, protected, strengthened, and healthy. Lord, that is where you're leading us. So guide us in this, in this journey. It is you who leads us. Thank you for your hope and, and your promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Speaking of journeys, I'm so blessed and happy to be on this journey with all of you. And um, so we're all, we are all on a journey, whether it be here or at home. And come to for just a little side note right here. I went to work the other day, and I was opening the gate. And because I'm on a journey, I have to go to work every day. Go figure, right? So I go to work, and I see a good friend of mine, Steve. And I'm like, Steve, is that you? And he opened the gate for me. It was pretty cool. I was like, whoa, man. Made for, made for a, a good day that God put me, put Steve and I on the same pathway. <clears throat> I thought that was cool. So, has anybody ever seen a movie? Any All movies, they have a beginning. And the beginning usually sets up the movie. Is that true? Or I think it's pretty true. And so, so, in the beginning of our service, how many songs do we sing? We sing three songs. What do you think those songs do? They set up our service, don't they? And that's part of worship. That's one of the four things he talks about. And so I th I, the worship, the different songs you sing, the words, they resonate in, in your mind. They take you to, to a different place. It can be a real, real good experience. Myself, I, I love music. and So in the, in the beginning... Excuse me, I'm sorry about this. In the beginning of the creation, and um, let me find the verse, the exact verse. It's in Job 38, verse 7, I believe. And so when God created the earth, the morning stars sang together, and the sons of man shouted for joy. So they sang in the beginning. So you know singing has, that's powerful. And when we're on the journey... Um, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So has anyone ever used the GPS on the phone? So do they ever scroll, for, scroll further ahead to see where you're going? We don't need to do that because he's the light to our path that's right in front of us. The, he gives us a light. We don't need to see what's a, I mean, it might scare you if you see what's ahead of you. you might, <laughs> so it'll be the light to our path. But here's what I wrote. That's all off my head, but I wrote this. In our lives, I believe a very important principle 
is an example is to be polite to people and they'll be, they're usually polite to you if you're polite to them. And that's uh, James 6.31, treat others as you want to be treated. And I know for myself I fall short of doing the right thing all the time. But if I take into consideration that principle and um, I do a good job. That's really pretty basic. But it can be difficult at times. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we hum humbly come before you, striving to serve you with willing hearts, knowing that you make, will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, everyone got their communion elements ready? That's good. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. Oh, great. I don't think he had this much problem. He took bread and broke it and said to eat this. And in the same way, he took the cup of his... This is a new covenant in my blood. Take, drink all this. Do this remember to me. For as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord in his death and he's coming again. Amen. Want to invite Barry up here? Yeah. Big, big, all right. Big bad Barry. This will be quick, so just a few announcements and things that we wanted to bring in. Um, let's see, a few prayer items. Um, um, obviously, we have a few folks that are still struggling health-wise. Um, anybody, how's Helen doing? I haven't heard. Is she doing better? Or is, is she? Okay, so she's still struggling with shingles, so continue to lift Helen up in, in our prayers and that. I mean, shingles is bad enough, you know, at any age, but it, for her age, it's really, really painful and hard. So so we continue to pray for Helen. I know um, Michael Belletti and Sherry Dalton are both still still a little bit. I saw Sherry this morning, but she's still a little bit under the weather. Continue to pray for them um, and that there. There are probably others that need that prayer. Um, I know we've got, got holidays coming, so um, we got travels. I know, I don't know how many people will be traveling, but I know um, John and Susan Leary will head, head out Tuesday on a, on a cruise, and they're going to be traveling, so prayer for their safety and their enjoyment. Um, anybody else got big travel plans that are going somewhere? So anyway, but yeah, pray for our folks that are out traveling. And that continued again, as we've shared, to pray for our spiritual journey, where we're headed. You know, praying for our leaders, pray for our interim pastors, um, Pastor Rob and Pastor Darren, and pray for the pastor that God's going to bring here in, in long term as a senior minister. He's got plans. And, and, and like Robert said, he doesn't show us the whole journey. He doesn't show us all the way down. He's just going to show us a little bit. Um, and now, let's see, for classes, um, there's um, no classes today. Um, we're going to be doing a leadership meeting, a board meeting, um, right after service here in the office, and so we don't have any classes today, and we're also not going to, it's Thanksgiving week, we're not going to do our Sermon 2.0 this week, so we're going to enjoy Thanksgiving, so you got to go home and be thankful and then make, make that plan, and that, and then uh, we haven't given specific dates, but coming up in January, um, Rob is going to begin a series of classes on, whoop, whoop, whoop. I think we'll just do one at a time, though, right? So, <laughs> and that. So that's going to be a really cool series. You don't want to miss. And that's, so that'll be coming up in January. And that. Um, first couple of Sundays in December, which it's scary. I'm thinking, I, December already? Do I? Uh, yeah, it's like not that far away, right? And that. We've got a couple of, of uh, on December 4th, we're going to do another congregational meeting real quick and just kind of share some, some things. We've also got elections coming up. For our leaders, we've got a budget we're needing to approve. So we're going to have a congregational meeting on the 4th, right after service. And then the next week, we'll do we'll actually do our voting and, and vote on the, on the leaders and the, and, and the budget. And that'll be on the 11th. So that won't take too long. Those should be fairly quick, but um, that'll be like right after service. And, that. and then um, as far as preaching goes, Pastor Darren will be back next Sunday and the, the following Sunday. 
And in December, we're going to be starting a cool um, Christmas series. We're not going to tell you what it is yet. We're going to leave you in suspense. But you, it'll be a good, great series um, on Christmas. So that's all coming up. So that's what I got. So let's worship, Rob. Let's do it. John, Susan, going on a cruise. Huh? Better not be a karma cruise like we talked about. <laughs> <clears throat> hey, how great is our God? Pretty great. <laughs> wow, right away. Well, man, words. How, where do I find the word? Uh, don't worry about it. Let your soul do the worshiping now. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice, how great! Our God, sing with me, how great is our God, all will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, all will see how great. Is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in Son, the lion and the lamb, the lion and the lamb. How great, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. How great. How great is our God, all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, name above all names, how great, worthy of all praise, so great, my heart will sing how great. Our God, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. I tell him you love him. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great. Our God, all will see how great, how great is our God. One more time, how great, how great, how great, how great is our God. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. We know that's only possible because you've loved us first. We thank you so much, Lord, for your incredible, amazing love. You are so great, Lord. Remind us, please, Lord. Forgive us for having to be reminded, but please, Holy Spirit, remind us daily, hourly, minute by minute, minute, how great you are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Say all these things to you, Lord Jesus, in the power and authority of your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Yeah, no problem, no problem.